All right, so we're going to get into the sequin materials followed by the land use. We're not going to cover, we're going to go cover a lot of materials, so this is going to be a little bit like a racehorse. And, and, you know, within the audience, we've got people who may be uh, relatively new to the planning profession. We've got seasoned professionals, so we're going to, we'll try to get everybody to the same starting point in terms of information. We may be covering some of the things you already know. Uh, so in CEQA, we've got, uh, and we would talk about court decisions. What we're really talking about are decisions that come from the Supreme Court, either U.S. Uh, or the, the federal appellate courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court the state appellate courts, and the state Supreme Court. Uh, you, you as practitioners will be aware that there's lots of trial court decisions and land use disputes, but those cases um, are not published. And when I say published, um, a published decision is, first of all, every Supreme Court decision, and number two, selected court of appeal decisions. So you may hear about cases or know of cases that went to the Court of Appeal, but if the court says we're not going to publish this, then it never gets a formal numeric citation like we'll see in, the, in or have you seen in the slides. Um, and within the CEQA field, uh, what makes CEQA rather daunting is typically in any year, we get 25 to 30 published appellate decisions, and that's maybe 20%. Uh, and that's an unscientific estimate, clearly, 20% um, of the total sequent decisions made by the Court of Appeals get published. So that's a lot of material that you as planners and lawyers have to master. And so what we're going to try to do, um, we're, we cannot in an hour give you an in-depth analysis of 30 published decisions. Our, uh, our objective is to give you a heads up in terms of things that you should be considering in terms of practice. And our normal sequence is we, we start with exemptions, neg decks, EIR, subsequent environmental review, and then litigation, and then legislation. And some of the categories are going to be a little bit arbitrary. There's all, we, we do talk about neg decks, but really in terms of a litigation uh, in the litigation section. So our primary focus is on exemptions, um, EIR, subsequent environmental review. Um, now, when it comes to exemptions, um, there are, of course, you're familiar with um, the uh, statutory exemptions where the legislature has said, hey, the following activity does not, is not subject to CEQA. So those are the statutory exemptions. And if you read the CEQA guidelines, most but not all of the statutory exemptions are listed in the guidelines. So the guidelines are a little bit behind the statute. It's, a no, it's not a comprehensive list. Um, and then you have the categorical exemptions, and that's where the Secretary, the Secretary of Resources Agency has said these categories of projects uh, are ordinarily to be considered to be exempt, but there may be unusual circumstances or there may be cumulative effects. And as practitioners, you really need to master the art of the uh, categorical exemptions and the exceptions. And so from a critical analysis, the, I think the most troubling issue uh, in the use of CAD X as categorical exemptions is whether or not the doctrine of unusual circumstances applies. And that what that does is that takes that activity out of the uh, safe harbor of a CEQA exemption and puts you back into environmental analysis. And so some of the cases, we do have a couple of exemption cases to talk about today. If, if you really want to master exemptions, my suggestion is that you go, for those of you in city or county government, is you go to the city attorney's office, county council's office, and get the CEB, uh, California Education of the Bar, get their CEQA book, and get the exemption chapter, and get that copied off, because it's a comprehensive list. If you go to the CEQA guidelines, um, the guidelines don't list every possible exemption. And even I get surprised going back to the CEB book going like, oh, well, there is an obscure exemption that's in the vehicle code, right, or the business and professions code. You won't find it in the public resources code. So if you really want to master that field, my advice is go to the city attorney's office. They've probably got the secret desk book. Get the exemptions chapter and make sure you've got that on hand in, in your own departmental library. Okay, so the first case we're going to get to is the case that's pending before the California Supreme Court. Uh, this is one of the UC, the, the juggernaut of lawsuits against the UC campus system. 
uh, whether it's undergrad or uh, medical facilities. And this case is pending at the California Supreme Court. Now, the, the questions that have been certified are, are in your materials. I don't, I don't devote time to, to pending cases because it's pure speculation as to what's going to happen. And it may be that this case becomes moot because the legislature did enact uh, statutes that large, I think have largely rendered uh, the issues pending before the California Supreme Court. So that's one of the things that the court will be looking at. So the first case we're going to get to is Lucas versus um, City of Pomona. This is a, um, you know, anybody can be a CEQA plaintiff. It can be a competitor, it can be a union, it could be the neighborhood group, it could be the Sierra Club, or it could be a cannabis operator that got cut out of an ordinance. And so Lucas files, Lucas is a, an operator within the city of Pomona. The city adopts new regulations for the location of cannabis retail. And they designate you know, half a dozen or eight sites, and Lucas isn't one of them. So what do you do? You, know, you, don't, you can't sue on the merits of the decision, but you can sue over environmental review. And the city relied upon uh, the, the guidelines section, and this is, an, this is one you need to master, 15183, for projects that are consistent with general plans, with the densities in general plan and consistent with goals and policies. That is a, a substantive tool that you can use to not get, to not necessarily be automatically exempt from CEQA, but at least substantially narrow or bypass the need to do additional environmental review. And it's been on the 15183 and its uh, uh, related PRC section has been on the books for years and years and years and, and really a super flexible tool for local, local governments. And so the city had said, hey, we don't need to do new environmental review because this project is consistent with the density set forth in the general plan. And, 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 and Lucas said, look, the general plan and general plan EIR never talked about cannabis. And this is a common argument when, when you're trying to use that exemption. And, and the court said, didn't have to. The issue is, are the physical impacts. And, and so the issue are there, with, are there impacts that are different than what had been studied at the general plan level. And so the court disagreed with um, the plaintiff, Lucas, in terms of trying to set aside the use of the 15183 exemption. I would add that there is, this is, this is case in point as to where the exemptions are, there act, this case preceded the enactment by the legislature in the Business and Professions Code that local ordinances providing for discretionary review are not subject to CEQA. So in a new fact pattern, you'd want to look at, if you're dealing with a new ordinance, you'd want to look at the B&P code provisions and not just rely upon this case because there's even more authority to uh, bypass the CEQA process. Gage. All right. Hello, everyone. I, my name is Gage Marcini. I am happy to be at Abbott and Kinderman. I want to thank Diane for her words of introduction. And hello, I'm glad to meet all of you. And in the interest of time, I'll get into it. Our next case is the Coalition for Historical Integrity versus the city of San Buenaventura, Ventura. This case arises out of uh, the wonderfully exciting year 2020, uh, which for the city of Ventura saw protests and vandalism occurring to the statute of uh, the statute of Juniper Junipero Serra, Father Junipero Serra. The statue was located originally out of the county courthouse, but at the time the courthouse had been converted into City Hall. The original statute was designated as a historic landmark, but importantly, the original statute deteriorated and in 89 was replaced by a bronze replica. Now, uh, following the protests and vandalism in 2020, the city hired a historical consulting group to do an analysis, a historical analysis of the replica statute and the consulting group's report concluded that the new statute didn't meet the criteria to be a historical landmark because it wasn't more than 40 years old, which was uh, one of the criteria. So the city adopts findings. Uh, they find that the statute does not meet the historic, uh, historic object criteria because it's not old enough, and they find that removal of the statue and relocation to the uh, 
Buenaventura mission um, falls under the common sense exception to CEQA because a non-historic statute being removed, uh, it's common sense that that doesn't have an effect on historic objects. Now, the petitioner petitions for a writ and alleges that the city's findings were not supported by substantial evidence and that the re that removal of the statute violated the specific plan, CEQA, and other state and municipal laws. Now, CEQA's protections extend to objects of historic or aesthetic significance. And in addition, things that are listed on cities' uh, registers of historic landmarks, historic resources, are presumed to have historic or cultural significance. But the court uh, points out that this presumption is rebuttable by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, uh, and they find that here, the city's finding was supported by substantial evidence that the statute was not uh, of historic value because of the age. Now, the proponent, or excuse me, the petitioner, argued that the report uh, couldn't constitute substantial evidence because the testimony, the interviews that were conducted as part of the historical analysis weren't included, and so maybe there were some issues with the foundation of that piece of evidence. But the court reminds us that cities, uh, then local agencies, are not held to the same rules of evidence that are necessarily applicable in a court of law. So the city was okay to rely on that, uh, regardless of any alleged uh, issues with the foundation of that piece of evidence. Now, uh, regarding, the, regarding the allegation that it violated the specific plan, the specific plan included reference to this as one of the city's historic landmarks. But the court makes a distinction uh, based on the city's finding that this statute, remember it was a bronze replica of the original statute, was not of historic value. And they characterized this not as a removal of historic status of the statute, but as two different objects. The original one that was uh, built in 1936 and the new one that didn't meet the qualifications. So because of this, the court finds in favor of the city that uh, they're finding that the new statute was never a historic object, didn't violate any of these, uh, didn't, didn't violate the specific plan. Now, uh, one additional thing uh, important from this case, the petitioner alleges that the city council, they were engaging in a quasi-judicial role when they were making these findings and that they did so with bias and prejudgment. The court disagrees. Uh, the court says actually what they were doing is they were making policy. Uh, they were making policy in reaction to community members' concerns and that that was a quasi-legislative activity and that the quasi-legislative activities undertaken by local agencies uh, do not have to be held to the same requirements of non-bias and uh, and proceeding without prejudgment. So the court uh, finds in favor of the city and upholds their findings. It, now we have another historic artifacts case. This is the Historic Architecture Alliance. Oh, Bill, can you go to the next? Yep. Uh, the Historic Architecture Alliance versus the city of Laguna Beach. Now, it, this this case actually involves the historical resources exemption to CEQA and also the historic resources exception to CEQA. The case arises in regard to a 1925 colonial revival home. Uh, a family purchases the home, it's listed on the city's historic uh, register of historic properties and the homeowners submit an application for remodel, uh, including an addition. Now, 
Over a period of three years, the homeowners work with the city, they work with a historic consultant, and they try and make sure that they revise the project so they comply with the Secretary of the Interior, the federal agency, the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties. Now, this is important because the CEQA exemption for uh, his, the, excuse me, the Class 31 Historical Resources Exemption uses the Secretary's standards as uh, the qualifier for meeting the exemption. And ultimately, the city approves the project, finding that it complies with the Secretary's standards and therefore qualifies for the Class 31 exemption. Now, Petitioner, a, a group formed by neighbors, they challenge the approval and argue that the qualification for the exemption was not supported by substantial evidence and that the exemption was barred because there was a fair argument that the exception, the historical resources exception applied, which barred application of the exemption and would have required uh, EIR, a full CEQA review. So uh, the, the, excuse me, <clears throat> So the court starts out by talking about these two things, the exemption and the exception. And uh, both of them rely on the Secretary of the Interior standards. And the court reasons that by finding that this project complied with the standards and therefore qualified for the exemption, this carries an implied finding that the exception did not apply, basically saying that because they comply with the standards and the city found they complied with the standards, it means they found that the project wasn't going to adversely impact uh, the historic resources, which would have brought it under the historic resources, resources exception. One other uh, issue in uh, one other issue in this case is an argument that the petitioner made regarding the changes that were made to the project over those several years that the proponent, proponents were working with the city to make sure that it complied with the secretary's standards. And the petitioner points to this legal standard that says you can't use uh, mitigation measures to qualify for an, a CEQA exemption and they try and characterize these changes as mitigation measures. But the court says, no, that's not the case. These were changes that were made before the project was considered, and they weren't mitigation measures that were placed on the project in the context of CEQA review. So because of that, the, uh, the court finds that uh, those changes don't preclude application of the historical resources exemption in this case. And finally, the court uh, also concludes that the, the fair argument standard, which the petitioner argued should be applied here, which, which would have required the city to conduct further CEQA review as long as there was a fair argument that the project would have an impact on here on historic resources. The court says that the fair argument standard doesn't apply in this context. Instead, we apply the substantial evidence standard, which means the court looks to make sure that the city's finding is supported by substantial evidence. And here, the court finds it is. Uh, the historic resources uh, consulting group has a report stating that it does, and the record supports that finding and on appeal, the court upholds the city's uh, approval. Okay, the next case is the California construction case. This is also an exemption case. County of Ventura um, enacts an overlay ordinance, and the overlay ordinance is designed to protect uh, migratory animal uh, or migration routes for uh, the, the wildlife within the county. And these uh, overlays impacted areas which had been designated by the state of California as important mineral resource areas. Uh, 
and they did it based upon uh, class seven and class eight exemptions. And class seven is actions taken by regulatory agencies for the protection of the environment. Class eight is actions taken, um, I'm sorry, class seven is taken, uh, actions taken by regulatory agencies to protect the natural environment. And class eight is actions taken by the regulatory agencies for the protection of the environment. Now these are not get out of jail cards under these exemptions. There are limitations. You'll see these cases involving uh, air districts adopting various regulations. And, and so they're, they are favored towards exemptions, but it's not a guaranteed um, pass from CEQA review. And the lead agency uh, also made a determination that under the common sense exemption, where it can be argued or established that there's no possibility of impacts, you can use the common sense exemption. So first takeaway is there's nothing wrong in CEQA with having a lead agency making multiple alternative exemption decisions. It makes good sense. If it's arguably close, go ahead and make that finding. You want to support that finding because at the end of the day, the court's going to look for substantial evidence in the record. Uh, sometimes in the heat of processing things, you know, you'll just see a laundry list of exemptions, no critical analysis. That probably won't survive judicial review unless those issues are addressed. Uh, so the best practice in terms of practitioners is to make sure you can, you, uh, you have supporting analysis for each of those exemptions. So again, there were three. It's okay to do those in the alternative. What it does is it forces the petitioner to win all of the arguments. And why that's important is we just represented a city in a lawsuit where the staff had made multiple alternative determinations. The petitioner attacked two of the three, but not the third. And the, and, and the net result was we were, at least at this point of the litigation, we were able to argue to the court that, look, everybody is bound by that third determination and there's been no challenge to it. The court's bound by it, the petitioner's bound by it, the city's bound by it. So we were able to bypass a secret challenge because staff had made multiple alternative findings. So very worthwhile practice. So they had, uh, the trial court uh, had ruled for the county saying these exemptions were valid. Goes up on appeal. The court of appeal does not address the common sense exemption. And to, to be truthful, after the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Muzzy Ranch, it's very difficult to win on a common sense exemption. Uh, that's just, it's super hard. It's a really high bar to pass. Uh, if that's the only thing you got going for you, you're, you're living as a gambler in, 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 in my book. Um, so the so Supreme Court doesn't do it. And interestingly enough, the Court of Appeal just said, look, you know, there's substantial evidence to support these. This is, this is a regulation to protect the environment. This is a regulation to protect the natural environment. Both these cat X's are entirely appropriate. So, the, so when, when you get in that argument, the petitioners will predictably argue, oh, there's unusual circumstances. And those unusual circumstances have to relate to a, to a potential environmental effect. So the court said, okay, what are the unusual circumstances? And they go, well, this particular ordinance affected a big geographic area. And so it's an unusual circumstance. It's not your typical type of, of regulation. And the court said, look, Look at the published decision in L.A. County in plastic bags. That was L.A. County-wide in terms of regulation. So there's nothing inherently unusual about a large geographic area in terms of a land use regulation. And they said, well, it's, it's going to you know, adversely affect these, uh, the extraction of these mineral resources. And the court said, so where's the analysis? It, it doesn't prohibit mineral extraction. So it's an argument, but where's the evidence? that supports the unusual circumstance exception to the use of the exemption. So for, I mean, kind of take away for cities and counties adopting, you know, environmentally protective ordinances, these cases are certainly worth, this case is certainly worth looking at in terms of how to build your argument under uh, class seven and class eight. Gage? All right. Uh, United Neighborhoods versus the City of Los Angeles. This case arises out of the development of a hotel project in Hollywood. 
and in the review of this project, the city determines that it meets the class 32 infill exemption to CEQA. Um, however, this hotel project would require the destruction of 40 apartment units, and not just 40 apartment units, but 40 rent-controlled apartment units. So maybe you see where we're going with the issue on this one. Now, the Class 32 infill exemption has several requirements. The one that is relevant here is the requirement that the project is consistent with all applicable general plan policies. The, so the city determines that it meets the requirements. Uh, petitioner files a writ alleging that the city failed to consider all applicable policies because it did not consider the housing element policies. The city argues that the housing element policies didn't apply to this project because this isn't a housing project. It's a hotel project. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, the trial court and the court of appeal disagree with this characterization. Uh, they say that this completely ignores the project's impacts on housing. And they say, hello, your housing element's very first policy is the preservation of housing and the preservation of affordable housing. Uh, the court also looks at the way that the housing elements goals are drafted and finds that they are drafted not to be exclusive to housing projects because the first policy and many of the additional policies speak to preservation of existing housing units in addition to production of additional housing. Uh, and while the court does state that the, the city didn't need to make specific express findings, there needed to be an indication in the record that it did consider the housing element policies in order for the finding that the infill, that the project qualified for the infill exemption to be supported by substantial evidence. Now, uh, the court concludes that that finding was not supported by substantial evidence because the the scope of the city's uh, the scope of the city's uh, discussion of the housing element was simply to state that it didn't apply because this wasn't a housing project. Now the court is careful to give a caveat to this, which is to say that they are not finding that the city was required to find that the housing element policies were outweighed by policies favoring the project. And they're also not saying that uh, such a decision by the city would have conflicted with the general plan. All they're saying is, in this scenario, the infill exemption, the class 32 infill exemption, requires the consideration of all applicable policies. And here, while the court would normally be uh, deferential to the city's determination and the city's weighing and balancing of these general plan policies, they can't do so because there's no indication in the record that the city actually considered those housing element policies. So both the trial court and the court of appeal find against the city um, and they grant the writ uh, rejecting the finding of the class 32 infill exemption. And I want to follow up on, on, on this case. The next case is also an infill exemption and, and, and an analysis. What, so to underscore Gage's point, this, the LA case is a failure to analyze not necessarily a dispute with the conclusion, but a failure to analyze. And in the uh, Pacific Palisades case, which is the next in the outline, uh, there was an argument that the infill exemption was inappropriate because there was conf conflict with uh, the policy on protecting views. And the court said, this is an urban area. There's, there's buildings all around this, around this site that have potential implications for, for views. There's no, there's, this is, this is, you know, we can, we can support, um, the city's finding with respect to conformity with the general plan. The, what I wanted to drill down on is the specifics of the language. You know, in this business, words count. Now, to me, it's potentially significant, and Gage highlighted this, 
it's potentially significant that the guideline says, um, it talks about consistency with the applicable, applicable general plan policies. As compared to saying it's got to be consistent with the general plan. And why is there a difference? If you looked at the issue of consistency as a land use issue, you would draw upon uh, Sequoia Hills versus City of Oakland, Lagoon Valley, and those cases that say, look, a project doesn't have to be consistent with every goal, policy, and objective, right? In Sequoia Hills, the staff report said, well, there's 17 relevant policies. The, this project is consistent with 12, and you, know, we don't you don't have to have consistency with every goal, policy, and objective. And the, and the appellate courts have said that's absolutely right. That's the correct way for a local government to interpret its general plan and its obligation for consistency. The one exception is if you have a mandatory policy that is intended to apply in each and every situation, the balancing test under Sequoia Hills and Lagoon Valley doesn't apply. Uh, but that's kind of the out, outlier. So it's interesting to me that the language in the guidelines doesn't ask for consistency with the general plan. It says you've got to be consistent with with all applicable general plan policies. So I think the, in the, ish, the latent issue that's in the 15332 in these two cases is, is there a meaningful distinction between compliance with all general plan policies versus being consistent with the general plan? And the court made a point in the LA case of saying, we're not gonna decide that issue. So there's still room to argue and there's still, still room to lose uh, on uh, the application of 15332. So, um, so that's a, so, so the Pacific Palisades is another infill exemption. The staff report supports the conclusion as to the applicability and the conformity with applicable general plan policies. So they didn't have the problem that LA had, which was the failure to, to analyze. Uh, the next case is uh, make you see a good neighbor. Uh, this is, you know, part of the litany. These, these cases have largely been uh, reversed through legislative changes. You know, the, the provisions regarding whether or not uh, increase in enrollment is a project for purposes of CEQA. UC had lost below, but they won at the legislature. So, um, and this is the one I believe that is pending at, the, there's two UC cases in our outline. This one's pending, the summaries at the beginning of the materials. I think the next case is the um, Planning and Conservation League versus Depart Department of Water Resources. So in, this has to do with the state water contracts. And DWR had entered into eight contract amendments with the state water contractors. Seven of the amendments were just, just dealt with financial terms. And the eighth amendment extended the life of the contracts. Um, and so the, the issue was what kind of environmental review was, was required. Um, and so the challenges to, um, in this case, the EIR, um, was several fold. First of all, they, are, they said that the DWR used the wrong baseline. And the baseline they used was that the fact that these contracts are currently in place, that the state is obligated to provide water subject to the terms of the contract. And these, con and these uh, amendments just extended the term. So the, the, ex the extension didn't uh, modify the physical environment. It just continued the existing contractual relations. And, and the reason why, uh, and, and so the court agreed, the appellate court eventually agreed, that the baseline that DWR used was the valid baseline, that the existing physical conditions meant these contracts were in place, and these contracts resulted in water deliveries around the state of California pursuant to the state water project. There's also an interesting argument here in segmentation, where at one point DWR had said, well, these contracts are going to be, be amended, and then we're going to deal with them as part of the, the Delta Water Project. The, the project that went from two tunnels is now a single tunnel facility. Um, and so the question was, ah, this is the stocking horse, this is the nose of the camel in the tent. You've, under CEQA, you have to look at the entirety of the project. And the court said, uh, and this is, uh, it, that the co connectivity was too um, uh, attenuated. 
for uh, these EIRs to be set aside, that so many other things had to happen between the state water contract amendments before the, the state, uh, before the Delta Water Project went forward, that the CEQA analysis on the, on the contract amendments didn't have to also include the Delta Project. They uh, went after uh, project definition. Now, the reason why the, and again, the project definition was a variation on this. You didn't describe the state Delta project as part of it, but that's addressed in the segmentation argument. But the reason why um, project description arguments get made is if a petitioner can convince a court that there's an error in the project description, it throws off the entire, it potentially throws off the entire EIR, throws off your range of alternatives. It permeates virtually all your chapters. So, and, 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 and in fact, if you look at the guidelines, the project description doesn't, isn't very demanding under the guidelines. It's general information about the project. So it shouldn't be a, um, too difficult of a hill to climb, but it has big payoffs for project opponents, because they can, if they, if they can convince the court, they can get one foot anchored on this pro project description issue, they can leverage it through the entire EIR and through the alternatives analysis and the statement of overriding considerations and the determinations of infeasibility. Uh, they also challenged unsuccessfully the range of alternatives. There were seven alternatives that were in, in the EIR. That's more than enough. It, it used to be when, uh, of course, this name won't mean anybody to mean anything to anybody. But Norm Hill used to write the CEQA guidelines for the uh, uh, for the Resources Agency, and, and Norm's characterization was, well, there's a rule of five. If you got five EIRs, the Court of Appeal will always uphold it. Uh, and, and I think. Norm was pretty close to the mark 35 years ago when he, when he made that statement. So this is rule of seven. If you get seven alternatives in there, you're in pretty good shape in terms of providing a reasonable range of alternatives, assuming you got the project description correct, right? Because if you get the description wrong, the alternatives analysis potentially goes out the window. Gage. All right. This case arises right here out of Sacramento uh, County, the County of Sacramento. Sacopolis Investments versus the County of Sacramento. Sacramento certified an EIR for the Mather South Community Master Plan, a, an 800-acre uh, mixed-use development project, residential, educational facilities, retail, parks, open space. Now, Sacopolis challenges the EIR, claiming that it was deficient because it used a methodology for analyzing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that had been rejected by the California Supreme Court in the 2015 case, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity versus the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, in this case, the uh, the lead agency in that CEQA review used the California Air Resource Board's uh, 2008 scoping plan as the significance threshold for GHG impacts. Uh, basically, the 2008 scoping plan uh, comes up with this number, 29% reduction in business as usual GHG emissions as our statewide goal. So in the CBD case, the lead agency says, okay, our project does better than that, so it, therefore the GHG impacts are less than significant. But in the CBD case, the court finds that uh, you still need to have, well, you still need to have evidence in the record that this threshold you're using is applicable to your project to your locality uh, that, you, uh, that you are evaluating during CEQA review. So Sacramento County also used the uh, California Air Resource Board's scoping plan methodology. And on that basis, uh, Sacopolis challenges the EIR, but the court looks carefully at what Sac County actually did. And Sacramento County didn't just use that statewide number. Sacramento County used the same, uh, the same methodology as the framework for determining local 
greenhouse gas, gas emission thresholds. They used specific data, data specific to this project, and parsed out the thresholds for different sectors of the development project. So because the Sacramento County analysis used the local data, the court found that in this case, there was substantial evidence uh, supporting their methodology for this GHG emission standard. And in coming to this conclusion, the court also clarifies that the CBD case didn't reject the Air Board's methodology entirely. It specifically just rejected the application of that statewide number without more support in the record, without substantial evidence in the record, that that number is actually applicable in this circumstance. And that is what Sacramento County got right and that is why the court found in their favor that, in fact, the methodology used was materially different from what was applied in the CBD case. And uh, certainly, uh, hopefully nobody's following the uh, now disfavored uh, model used in the original CBD case, and, and certainly the models we see are much more sophisticated and they're sector-based. And, and really a dramatic change. The issue that I have in the back of my mind is, you know, they're, they're, it's almost like the emperor was wearing no clothes. We've got this climate change strategy that's predicated upon uh, decarbonization of the transportation industry. And you don't have to read a lot of newspapers in the last month that suggests that the consumer confidence uh, an option for going all electric may be, may be waning, or conversely, there may be an issue in terms of long-term electrical supply delivery if everybody does decarbonize their fleet. Um, and so, uh, you know, someday somebody's going to have a perfect sector analysis, and the opponents are going to argue to the court saying, hey, where's the evidence that supports this major assumption that the state's going to be able to deliver on decarbonization on the grid as well as in, in the transportation sector. So I, don't, I wish I could give you an easy answer to that, other than that it's, I think it's out there, and hopefully the state uh, does get it right. Um, next case, save our capital. This deals with the reconstruction of the former annex, or deconstruction and reconstruction of the former annex. Uh, for the state capitol that would be at the east end of the capitol. Uh, now, this is where the project description issue can come back and haunt the agency. Now, I read the fact pattern, and, and the way the project was approved was almost a design-build type contract, where it wasn't there was a highly defined, articulated, uh, arch basic architectural plans for this, for this annex. It was a project in motion because they wanted to get the environmental review going. Now, there's legislation that was passed specific to this project that said in the event of a CEQA conflict or whatever, uh, the court cannot, uh, the remedies available to the court do not include a prohibition on demolition. So you've got a specific statute, and this is pretty rare. We've got, we've got these regent statutes that have come in after a lawsuit has been filed. This was a statute that was enacted before the lawsuit got filed. But they aren't all that common, and, 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 and any relief is basically limited. Special legislative relief apparently is limited to state projects, UC projects, and if you own an NFL team or a basketball team. The rest of us are cut loose by the legislature. You know, we, 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 we live or die by our own uh, ingenuity. So the, uh, the lawsuit got, got filed, and, and because it was a design-build project, they're going through the environmental review and they come up with an improvement in terms of the architectural design that is thrown into the final EIR. And that's where they cross the line. Uh, we talked about having a, you know, a stable project description, but in this case, the project description was evolving and the Court of Appeals said, hey, the public had the right to participate. And it's a hard standard because at the same time the court said that, the court said, look, it, we, don't, we don't want projects to be frozen in, it, in, in, in its earliest image. I mean, in, in theory, if you're going to go through this environmental review process, you're going to hear from the public, you're going to hear from the critics, whatever, that if there's an opportunity for the applicant to change the project, to be responsive to 
public input and public values, they should do so. But you do so at some risk. So again, this is, I mean, the, the, the distinction here is, and, and I still think the concept that if the public weighs in and you make an adjustment that is environmentally responsive and responsive to the public, you should be okay on this project description. I think maybe the risk in this case was it essentially was a design build. And, and that is the public really couldn't, it, it was a moving target as it went through the environmental review process. Um, there, was a, there was also an argument that um, on recirculation, uh, so as it went through the EIR process, got to the final EIR, there was, a, you know, the, some changes were made to the project, that's the project description component of the, of the case. And as a result of those physical changes, there was different impacts to the number of trees that would have to be removed. And it sounds like a big number. It went from, you know, uh, three, uh, three percent of the trees to, to uh, the tree, the number of trees to be cut were almost doubled. And you know, it's a it's a mature urban forest with all the different endemic uh, natural species in California. Um, but the court said, yeah, it may have almost doubled, but the percentage of tree removal only went from three and a half to like five percent. It's not a substantial change in the project. The lead agency didn't have to recirculate. Again, the recirculate, or not again, but on the recirculation issue, it's always a test about is there substantial evidence in the record to support why you didn't recirculate? And it's almost like you have to prove the negative in terms of that staff report. But that final EIR, or at least the findings associated with the project, should always um, make an attempt to address why if anybody has even raised the word recirculation, you really want to have some kind of analysis and findings to support why you didn't. Gage? All right, County of Butte uh, versus DWR, Department of Water Resources. This case uh, has a long history. It involves the hydroelectric power facilities at the Orville Dam. Uh, the 50-year license expired in 2007 Prior to that, actually, I believe in 1999, DWR had begun the process of uh, trying to recertify the dam and get it relicensed for another 50-year period. Uh, in 2008, DWR certified the final EIR, and Butte and Plumas County challenged its sufficiency. In the EIR, DWR ultimately concludes that uh, the project's potential operation challenges due to climate change uh, were too uncertain to evaluate. So, therefore, uh, CEQA did not require further analysis on this. Now, from where we stand now in 2024, that may seem pretty unreasonable and unusual, but keep in mind, this EIR was certified in 2008. So, the court looks uh, for substantial evidence on the record, and they see that DWR considered numerous reports on potential effects on climate change, on precipitation, uh, all these variabilities, and after considering all of these reports and studies, they came to that conclusion that uh, it was too uncertain to evaluate, and the court upholds uh, that conclusion, finding that there is substantial evidence. But the court is careful to note that, again, this is based on the information that was available to them in 2008. And that does not mean that DWR could reach the same conclusion today, because reviewing uh, lead agencies are required to stay in step with evolving scientific knowledge. Now, uh, the petitioners, uh, the County of Butte, also alleges that the EIR fails to adequately analyze the costs, the economic costs, that the project will cause Butte County to incur. Now, CEQA can require uh, an agency to consider economic effects of a project if those economic effects contribute to or cause um, or contribute to or are caused by a physical change in the environment. Now, uh, 
what the county is alleging is that this project will cause an increased demand in public services like law enforcement. But the, the court ultimately rules that the county doesn't meet its burden uh, on this argument because the county never establishes that there's a link between these costs that it's saying the EIR failed to consider and a physical change in the environment. So, therefore, without that evidence, DWR wasn't required to consider it in their review. And the third thing I'll talk about in this case is that the court upheld a $675,000 cost bill for preparation of the record. Now, the court notes that this is a very high cost bill, but looks at some of the factors around it. This project had been ongoing for uh, more than a decade. The record was over 327,000 pages long. It required uh, more than a year to prepare. There were over 200 employees that had potential information and uh, sites that the $2.06 per page was not unprecedented citing to other record cost bills uh, that have been upheld, which were as high as $2.55 or even $3.50 per page. Now, one other notable thing in this case that the, the court makes continuous comments uh, throughout its opinion regarding the petitioner's treatment of the record, and it's a, a good cautionary tale uh, on some hyperbole and some loose citations to the record. The uh, one quote from one quote from the petitioners, one of the petitioners' brief is they call this cost bill one of the darkest passages in California's storied water history. And at numerous times, the court notes that the petitioners miscite uh, dates or numbers uh, using cost estimates uh, as future uh, analysis when actually they were estimates of uh, before the project, uh, before the renewal of the license. And uh, that was important to the court, I, I think, especially in its consideration of the cost bill. And ultimately, the court upholds the cost bill, finds in favor of DWR on all counts, and uh, this hopefully ends a very, very long case. This was the third time this Court of Appeal considered this case. Uh, this case had gone to the Supreme Court twice before, and now, perhaps, the Orville Hydropower Facilities can actually receive that new 50-year license for uh, continued operation. Okay, we're going to have to do some acceleration here. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. Not, <laughs> I'm the one that tends to go long, so that, that's a self-directed comment. So the Yerba Buena case challenged to the UC revitalization plan for the uh, Par Par Parnassus uh, campus. And it was a facility that had been um, subject to underinvestment by the UC because they built major facilities down by the basin uh, close to south of downtown, and, and, and now they were shifting their investment strategy, and they needed to modernize their buildings. Just very briefly, um, reasonable range of alternatives, um, uh, failure of the EIR to look at, at public transit, but the court found enough an analysis in an appendix to say it's not was not a prejudicial error. I mean, you don't you don't win many times win your cases if the court of appeal has to wormhole into the administrative 300,000 page administrative record to find some kind of supporting analysis. But again, even though it's a CEQA error, it has to be prejudicial. And they said it wasn't prejudicial because we can find a sufficient discussion of the issue in the appendix. Visual and aesthetic impacts, but because this was a employment center um, on an infill site in a high transportation corridor, no, no requirement to look at visual and aesthetic impacts. The one thing I want to do is connect this case and the Oakland case on wind impacts. So the mitigation language that's similar in both, both those cases has to deal with uh, will mitigate to the extent feasible. Well, that's just deferred mitigation. I mean, you, you, you know that that cause of action is coming at you in, in the complaint. 
And so what does that mean? And, and, the, and the appellate court, the same appellate court, in two different cases, Parnassus and the Oakland uh, Stadium downtown, reached contrary conclusions uh, where there's very similar concepts. So the language here was that uh, later on, because all these buildings hadn't been designed yet, um, that the lead agency would identify feasible mitigation strategies to eliminate or reduce wind hazards to the maximum feasible extent. To be honest with you, that doesn't tell the public anything. That's a losing issue. But the court said, well, we interpret that phrase, Max, they, they could look elsewhere to construct what, what that phrase meant. Well, I mean, that's your job as a lead agency. Don't expect the Court of Appeal to ferret out supporting language somewhere in the ER that explains an ambiguous phrase, like to the maximum extent feasible. Because in Oakland, on almost the identical language, they call for wind mitigation to the extent, it, uh, and let's see, I can't remember the exact language. The court just said, we can't, we can't define the standard. The standard's not defined, it's deferred mitigation. You haven't told the public exactly what you're gonna do. So as practitioners, you've got, and only under rare circumstances should you ever use a phrase like to the maximum extent feasible because I think you're, you're really susceptible to a successful challenge. Gage? All right, I'll lead into this one with uh, just noting that uh, in that second paragraph, this quote is cut a little short. Uh, so the principle is CEQA requires agencies to refrain from approving projects for which there are feasible alternatives or mitigation measures, which would substantially lessen the proposed project's significant environmental effects. Now, the, the issue in this case is uh, the proponent, the petitioner, the petitioner claims that the city failed to analyze compensatory mitigation uh, on a project which required the destruction of four historic buildings. These historic buildings are of a specific brutalist style of architecture and represent a specific economic development period in the city's history. And those two facts are important because in considering whether the compensatory mitigation was actually feasible, uh, the court ultimately finds that it was not because for compensatory mitigation to apply, the guidelines provide that the mitigation, uh, the, that mitigation can include compensation by providing or replacing substitute resources. Now these substitute resources have to have some sort of nexus to the historic value of the resources being impacted. Now, during the review, the record supports that the city looked on the list of the register for other historic buildings and finds there's nothing else that represents this same brutalist style of architecture, and there's nothing else uh, on the register that supports this same historic economic development period. So because there was no, there were no other buildings uh, that the city could require as mitigation, the project proponent financially support preservation of those buildings, uh, the court concludes that mitigation, uh, the compensatory mitigation sought by the petitioner was not feasible and upholds the city's uh, EIR. Uh, yeah, and there's one other brief. There's one other brief thing I'll note. The um, the petitioner also claimed that the city uh, failed to f adequately respond to its comments uh, to the EIR when it raised these issues about compensatory mitigation, and the court acknowledges that perhaps in the final EIR there isn't a reasoned analysis that would be required, but the court looks at both the final EIR and the draft EIR and finds that between the two, there's sufficient discussion of these issues that I just discuss, discussed about the lack of uh, substitute properties and determines that collectively between the draft and final EIR, 
there is adequate response. Bill? All right. So, uh, school impacts in 60 seconds or less. Salinas, <laughs> specific plan, 4,000 units. School district shows up and says, look, the state subvention of X dollars per square foot for new construction is insufficient to build the schools that we need to build. I've heard that, and we've probably all heard that argument, and, one, and frankly, there's probably a little bit of truth to it. Um, so they challenge a specific plan saying, you know, that it's inadequate because the, the real world mitigation effects uh, or, or uh, impact fee strategy is insufficient to build the required schools. And the, the city, uh, two things. So at the trial court, the trial court said, school district, you're right, we agree. And the court issued a writ to, um, wait, let me, yeah, so the court, the court exercising the remedy provisions in CEQA did not invalidate the plan. So the plan was in effect, and they used the severance provisions in the CEQA litigation remedy provisions and said, hey, city, go back and fix, do an additional analysis. So the developer is on the hook, however, for the attorney's fees. So while the city complies with the writ to go back and do a supplemental study, now it's critical that the court didn't say set aside the plan. So the plan stayed in place, but they went back to do a supplemental analysis. The developer appealed and convinced the appellate court that the trial court was wrong. And, and so there is a very, for any lawyers here, there is a very important procedural strategy here. It's be, because the, if the trial court had been compelled to, excuse me, if the trial court had compelled the city to set aside the plan and the city complied with the writ, then I don't think the appellate court uh, it could ever do anything about it. I mean, it, it could rule on the, the merits of the issue because it's relevant to whether or not the developer has to pay attorney's fees, but there's no real remedy. If the city has already set aside and complied with the writ and, and invalidated the resolution, what's the appellate court, what kind of remedy can the court do? So it's still relevant for the attorney's fees, but in this case, because the remedy was, was fashioned so narrowly, it, it allowed the city to comply, get it fixed, and preserve the ability of the developer to go up and argue the merits of the decision and got a reversal at the Court of Appeals. So the bottom line was this, um, the ultimate argument that the developer prevailed upon was this issue of future school funding spread out over a 20 or 32, 20 to 30 year period, the argument's based on speculation. We don't know what the state's going to provide in terms of bond funding, what's going to be available. And the court said it's speculative, it doesn't have to be analyzed, the city did an inventory, um, and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the city doesn't control when the schools get built. The city doesn't control what the schools are going to look like, where they're going to be located, how they're going to do staffing. So there's a lot of speculation that got into it. So this case, I think, is relevant for uh, cities doing general plan documents, specific plans, community plans. You can look at this case as it relates to the level of detail that you need to go into as it relates to other public agencies, water districts, sewer districts, school districts that could be impacted by, let's say, a large specific plan. Gage? This case, the Marina Coast Water District versus the County of Monterey involves this, uh, a desalination project uh, proposed in Monterey County. It's a multi-jurisdictional project. The California Public Utilities Commission is the lead agency. They approve a final EIR. However, there's still additional approvals from other public agencies that are required. Now, one of those uh, additional approvals is well permits uh, that are to be drilled in the coastal zone, and the city of Marina denies these permits, and the project proponent appeals the denial to the California Coastal Commission. Now, while the appeal's pending, Monterey County has separate project approvals it's considering for the building of the, the physical desalination facilities. Marina County denied the well permits. Now Monterey, or Marina, the city of Marina denied the well permits. Now Monterey County is considering the facilities. And Monterey County uh, approves the permits to construct the plants. 
after the approval, Marina Coast Water District challenges the approval, claiming that uh, Monterey County was required to do supplemental uh, environmental review due to new information that had arisen since the California Public Utilities Commission had certified the final EIR. Now the rule here is that once the EIR is final, no further steps are generally required uh, for CEQA review unless d there is further discretionary approval required. If there's further discretionary approval required, that public agency needs to determine if there have been substantial changes to the project or substantial changes in the conditions under which the project is being undertaken, which would require additional environmental review, or if new information has come to light that wasn't known at the time of the EIR. Now, the marina, the water district's main argument here is that the new information is the denial of the well permits by the city of Marina. But the court says, well, wait a minute. Actually, that's no different than when the uh, CPUC approved the, uh, approved the final EIR to begin with. At that time, they didn't have approval for well permits, and it's no different now. The Coastal Commission is reviewing the, the permit applications. They're reviewing it de novo, so there's, there's uh, no issue with any findings from the city's denial. And the court concludes that it's no different and it doesn't come to the level of a significant change that requires further review. Uh, another issue on appeal is the water district challenges the county's statement of overriding considerations. Because the project had significant unavoidable environmental impacts, the county was required to make a statement of overriding considerations, weighing the benefits of the project over its environmental impacts. And the county, in doing this, identifies six potential benefits. Of these six benefits, five are water-related. But the water district argues that the, the county can't rely on these, these water-related benefits because they're speculative. They're speculative because the approvals haven't been received to provide the water source for this uh, desalination plant because the well permits were denied. Uh, and so they argued that the county can only rely on its uh, sixth benefit, which is economic benefits of construction, jobs, um, those benefits. And the trial court agreed with this, the specula speculative benefits argument. But on appeal, the court disagrees. And uh, the court rather strongly states that, that if we adopted that reasoning, it would result in this absurd result that anytime we have these big, complex projects that require approvals from different public agencies, they would all be stymied because each of those agencies would be stuck waiting for all the other agencies to act before they themselves can act. So the court finds that the, um, the county was, uh, did properly consider the total benefits of the project, not just the specific, specific benefit, the economic benefit under its jurisdiction. Uh, it was permitted to consider all the benefits, all the potential water supply benefits, and the court reversed the trial court's uh, grant of the writ and, uh, ordered a, and ordered the trial court to uh, uphold the county approval. Okay, Claremont uh, Canyon, uh, you know, fire protection in 60 seconds or less. Um, this is another UC Regent project. This is above the old Bear Stadium. You go up the hill, that's Berkeley property up there. Uh, many of you may know that a lot of that is pl planted in uh, relatively f uh, flammable materials such as eucalyptus. Um, and so the, the Regents wanted to have a... Um, um, a wildfire management, implement a wildfire management plan, okay? And 
We've talked about the need for a, a stable project description, but this case illustrates not every project lends itself. I mean, when somebody brings in a subdivision, yeah, you can see the map, you can see the lots, it's got a defined boundary. It's not necessarily going to change a lot. We've got the, the capital project where it was a design build and the project kind of kept changing through the environmental review process, so that's kind of the other end of the spectrum. In this case, the project description was um, uh, vegetation management through, quote, variable density thinning. Well, that kind of, what does that mean? And, and I think that you would be at, at risk defining uh, most projects that way. But the Court of Appeal upheld the description uh, to two arguments. One was there was no tree count. The lead agency never told the public how many trees are going to be removed. The court said they didn't have to. It was impractical because of steep terrain. It was impractical because over the life of this project, the trees that were out there today, some would be gone. New trees would be grown. So having a stable project description plus the cost, although you know regions have a pretty robust budget, I don't know that they couldn't have spent $30,000 to do a tree survey, um, but the court said they weren't required to. I think so to me the interesting part of the case is this variable uh, density thinning and, and what it meant was over the course of this project area because of vegetation changes that in some cases you've got you've got natives, you've got uh, exotics like eucalyptus, you've got manzanita which is highly flammable, you've got madrone, highly flammable. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't like you could do a subdivision where you could lay out, I'm going to put, I'm going to cut here. I'm, and, and because it's, it's an interactive process, it's an iterative process that's really resolved in the field by the forester. So this is a case where the court, dis, that despite having a, the lack of a hard edge definition, uh, the court said this description, if you read the EIR, you could tell what the obligation was on the forester, what their management strategy was. The public was reasonably uh, educated in terms of uh, what was being proposed. Uh, the East Oakland, I just quickly, this is the, I want to talk about the wind issue. We talked about on the Parnassus, the buildings hadn't all been designed. There was a design standard, and the court was able to cobble together what maximum extent feasible meant to uphold it as a mitigation measure. City of Oakland, in doing this, the stadium, however, used uh, the phrase that, you know, mitigation for wind would be required unless it unduly restricted development. Well, that's kind of saying it's infeasible by but just using a different phrase. And, but the court couldn't cobble together what unduly restricted development. So one takeaway is that none of you will ever write an EIR that uses the phrase unduly restrict development. Okay, that's your takeaway. You know, that, that pays for the, the, uh, the admission price here. Um, and so it's you know, so it, the same appellate court, right? In one case, uh, they upheld it on Parnassus because they could, I think they struggled, but they could cobble together what that phrase made. So I would just, I'd be cautious. I would, I think max, again, maximum extent feasible is a, uh, is the fourth cause of action. You might, you might as well say, okay, I'm going to get sued on this ground. Now, can I make it look better? All right, let's see what we got. Save our axis. Uh, this was just, um, uh, briefly on, on the San Diego case, uh, on the world of initiatives. Initi initiatives are codified in the California Constitution as a result of the election of Hiram Johnson in 1912, um, or, or contemporaneously with his election. And if the citizens draft an initiative measure, it's not subject to CEQA. So they can change the general plan. They can rezone property. They, they're subject to the substantive requirements for general plans and for zoning and the like. Uh, but they don't have to go through the CEQA review process. But if the city council decides to put an initiative on the ballot for the voters to approve, the city council has to go through the CEQA process. And so this case deals with whether or not a prior initiative, excuse me, a prior general a community plan and EIR had contemplated that at a future point in time, the city would remove the height limits. And so the height limit measure was an initiative put forward to the voters and the, the uh, or to, to, to eliminate the height limit within this community plan. 
was approved by the city council to go on the ballot. And the city said, we don't need to go through environmental review because the prior community plan and EIR assumed that this height limitation would be removed. So it's a factual question. Did the EIR contemplate that buildings could be constructed to access height? And the answer was no. That was never on anybody's radar screen when the community plan and EIR was done years earlier. Uh, IBC, this is a, you know, a, 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 essentially a precise plan or specific plan. And within this plan, it's a little bit unusual. It's got you know, all these existing parcels out there. And the, the plan has a land use budget. It allocates square footage on every single parcel. So this is a project in which uh, that, uh, that budget is moved between parcels, but it's consistent with the overall mathematical strategy underlying the plan. And, and so the question was, did they have to do new environmental review? Was it covered by 15183? And the answer was they didn't have to do a new environmental review because they were consistent with the land use budget. I don't you know, maybe those documents exist up here in Northern California. I haven't seen one in, in a while. Um, let's see, what do we got here? H. I'll do these next two quickly. Olin Properties, uh, the city approves a housing project relying on an addendum to an EIR prepared in 2006 as part of a general plan update. Uh, it's challenged claiming that there was new information, should have done uh, new EI, or should have done further EI, EIR review, and the changed condition that is claimed is that the addendum uh, utilizes the uh, LOS measure, the level of service measure uh, for traffic impacts. And in 2018, this was changed to the VMT, Vehicle Miles Traveled. Uh, however, the LOS measure was used because the original 2006 EIR used that measure. And the court holds that it's well settled in California that a subsequent change in the guidelines is not new information requiring a new EIR. Uh, now on McCann, what I'll say on McCann is the, the takeaway from this case is that the court's continuing jurisdiction uh, when a writ is granted ends once the specific directives of the writ are complied with. Uh, the continuing jurisdiction doesn't continue after the writ has been complied with and uh, the, the agency, the lead agency continues with further seek re review activities, uh, it ends when the writ is satisfied. Bill? Yep. So on uh, 186, 187, uh, we're gonna skip the sequel litigation cases. They're relatively minor this year in terms of compared to the other materials we've covered. 186, 187 is legislation. Um, the ones that kind of caught my eye uh, would be the infill less than 10 units. Um, that's an existing uh, Starter Home Revitalization Act of 2021. Infill for sale units can now be exempt. The, the subdivision map, the tentative map, is exempt from, from CEQA review. Um, and then on the next page, the interface of the Housing Accountability Act and CEQA, that if the lead agency uh, is incorrect in uh, processing CEQA exemptions or streamlining, it can be a cause of action or violation of the HAA, which means now you can get sued by the developer. So, you know, it's like get a ticket and get in line, right? It's the labor unions, it's the neighbors, it's now the developer. Um, so those are probably, um, and not to uh, dismiss the significance of the, of the rest of the legislation, but um, those are the two that caught my eye. I just want to talk briefly on the, what well, really trim the land use side. Uh, Crescent Trust is a heads up case at the California Supreme Court, deals with antiquated subdivisions. Generally, when we talk antiquated subdivisions, we're talking about uh, non-urban counties, but here's a case for the city of Oakland, a map that is, I think, probably uh, 1865, uh, for and subdivided, created a bunch of lots, and the question, would, the, we've got the history in here, but again, it's a pending case at the California Supreme Court and did a, was a later transaction, which was a subset of these parcels on an 1865 map. 
was that exempt from the Subdivision Map Act and were, the, were each of the units that are described um, uh, separate legal parcels. And, they, and the city lost at the Court of Appeal but convinced the California Supreme Court to uh, take it up. Um, I think we've probably hit the end of our time. And Gage, anything else in, in your last cases there that you want to? I think I think the only, uh, one other case of note that um, I'll mention as briefly as I can is the Martinez v. City of Clovis housing case. Um, it, this case arises out of the City of Clovis's attempts to um, uh, comply with all of the new housing legislation, and uh, specifically the the issue here is. The city of Clovis did not meet their regional housing needs allocation. They had carryover, uh, and when you have carryover, you're required to uh, adopt these minimum requirements. You have to rezone within the first year of the new cycle. Um, you have to rezone to allow uh, owner-occupied and rental multifamily housing by right and you have to rezone with a minimum density of 20 units per acre. What Clovis tried to do is first they adopted a new housing element uh, that included a program that said they would do all of those things. They didn't do it. Um, that's self-explanatory why that's an issue. Uh, the, they then several years later attempted to become compliant by adopting an overlay zone that included these minimum zoning requirements. However, uh, the overlay zone, um, while the overlay zone met the required density uh, requirements, the base zoning still permitted development at lower densities. And the court found that because of this, they hadn't complied with the statutory minimum requirements uh, mandating these specific zoning densities. And one other takeaway is uh, municipalities are required to affirmatively further fair housing. And the court found that by failing to have an adequate housing element and by failing to comply with these zoning requirements, they had failed in that duty. And the court also determined that while that um, AFFH uh, legislation didn't include an enforcement provision, the court held that enforcement in court was uh, a proper method of enforcing that uh, duty that exists on the city. Yeah, there are some important housing cases that, but, but um, regrettably we're out of time. I want to briefly refer to Discovery Builders versus City of Oakland, where uh, a project gets approved um, and the developer enters into an agreement with the city that says the project has to pay the following fees. Um, now, interesting question, why would the city enter into an agreement? I mean, the fees are the fees, right? Several years later, the, now it takes a while to build this project out. Uh, I think it's a later developer comes along, they step into the shoes of the original developer, and by this point in time, the city has now adopted three new fees. They've got an affordable housing fee, They've got a transportation fee and a capital improvement fee. And the developer goes, hey, I don't have to pay these fees because I've got an agreement with the city. And the, pro and, and the court said, that doesn't bind later city councils from enacting new fees. And what's interesting, and, and, and so this takes us back in time to the California Supreme Court case 1976 AVCO versus the Coastal Commission where AVCO in response to the Coastal Commission had said hey we, we entered an agreement we gave the state of California this park Dana Park we're not subject to these new land use rules and and the courts then the California Supreme Court said well that would be contracting away your police power to to have this agreement say that later you know land use rules don't apply and so it was that discussion in AVCO that led to two things. One, the vesting map law in California. Now, in this case, I think the, the vesting benefits under a vesting map had timed out. They only last for like 12 to 24 months after you record a final map. And this was several years later. So, yeah, even under a vested rights analysis under the Subdivision Map Act, you, there would be no real argument. 
But uh, so I think technically the court got the right decision because the only way by statute that you can contractually bind a city council is through a development agreement. There's no discussion of that in this case. It's kind of a mystery where the court could have said, well, here's the agreement, but if you really wanted to argue vested rights, you would have had a development agreement, and this agreement was never adopted in conformity. So there's no discussion, and I don't know if uh, you know we're going to go back in time now to 1976 and now re-argue whether or not development agreements constitutionally can bind later city councils. I think, you know, in, in the early 80s, you know, cities and counties were very f afraid of that language um, in the AFCO decision, and, and now local governments are, in many cases, are very, in, in, uh, are very insisting that you do a development agreement because they want to put a bunch of stuff in there and they want to negotiate for some special provisions. So I don't know if we're going to have to reinvent the wheel uh, out of this case. But it's interesting, they, they, for some reason, there's no discussion of development agreements, so it doesn't, it, it, this decision does not invalidate, directly invalidate the use of a development agreement. It may be argued as to whether or not a development agreement is valid, but it doesn't directly do that. So I'm going to ask Diane and Glenn to come up in, here and see if we've got any questions.